So I just need to get my uh, clicker device out. Hopefully I've got it here. If not, I can fake it. So somebody told me it might rain today. Did you see that? It might rain. I'm from San Diego, California. It, it literally never rains there. So I love to see some rain. That's kind of nice. Well, let's see if my clicker will work. And if so, off we go. And if not, we'll fake it. Looks like we're good. So are we supposed to just get started? Is this it? Yes. Off we run. OK. So I'm Woody Zool. I'm a software developer. I've been writing software for about 35 years or so. I started uh, writing software before any of you were born. And um, just kidding. Uh, I found it so interesting that I turned it into my, my way of making a living. And I'm going to share with you an experience that I've had over the last five years uh, at a particular place that I got a job at. And uh, this is such a compelling story to me, and I'm really glad that other people find it interesting. So I appreciate you coming to hear this today, and let's see what we can discover. So first of all, I want to be really clear that I'm not here to tell you how to do something or whether or not you should do something. I'm here to share something that we did that you might find interesting. And uh, I kind of like to ask already, is anybody here do mob programming in your work? Is anybody doing it? So there's three, four. Uh, before this conference, had you heard of mob programming? Who's heard of it before this conference? And the rest of you, you just saw it on the, on the conference paperwork and said, well, let's go see what that is. Is that what it's like? <laughs> All right. So. Uh, it's a kind of an interesting idea. So mob programming is a way of programming where all the brilliant people are working on the same thing at the same time and in the same space. Now that doesn't, that's not too much different than from what Agile is. Agile software development uh, took this to heart. They noticed that working in a phased approach where, where you would work on something and then when you were done with it, you'd hand it off to someone else and they would work on it. And when they were done with it, they'd hand it off to someone else and they would work on it. That's a phased approach to doing software development. Some people call that the waterfall. But the basic idea is people are working at different times on the same thing. Agile, I think in general, the idea in Agile is let's bring all this stuff together, let's work on it together. And mob programming, which is a lot like pair programming, just focuses on the idea that we're going to work at the same time on something. And we do that by working at the same computer. So rather than having people sitting at separate computers, we're all sitting in the same space. I like to think of it as we're going to bring the whole team together. We're all different, but we're going to work all together. So we have different skills, different abilities. We're going to put them all together, working on the same thing at the same time and in the same space. So it looks like this from the front. You can kind of see the whole team is gathered together at a table. And this is what it looks like from the back. So from the front and from the back. So you can see basically we have a couple monitors, or in this case projectors, that are projected up on the wall. And everybody's just sitting together, looking at the same monitors, talking about the work and working on the work. And I'll share how that actually happens. This company where we started doing this was almost exactly five years ago. And I'm going to share the story of how we uh, started doing this and why we started doing this. Uh, this is what it looks like there now. So we had one team. Uh, doing it. Now we have, I believe they have eight teams. So this is the work area. We'll see a video if we can. I'm not sure if I can get online to get it. We'll see a video about that in a second. So you can see there's these workstations. We no longer have the projectors. What we have is, is large 80-inch uh, monitors, 4K monitors, usually three per workstation. So that gives you a little bit of view of what it's like. You could also do this remotely. This is a team in Richmond, Virginia that does the mob programming remotely. They're all working on the same thing at the same time. They're sharing the keyboard across the internet through a video conferencing or something like that. Uh, this is the place where we started. I like to give them a tip of the hat. I worked there for four years. Hunter Industries in San Marcos, California. If you ever make it to San Diego area, they're near San Diego. Uh, they always invite visitors to come and spend time with them. So if you happen to make it to the area, you want to spend a day seeing what this is like, you just have to get in touch with them. You can do that through me and go see what this is like in an actual environment where they're doing this all the time. Um, so I'm going to show you some pictures. Here, this is also Hunter. So you can see 
uh, they've got a work standing workstation. Uh, this is some people in Alaska. Alaska is a state in the United States. Uh, this is some people in France. Here's some people in Hungary. GDS in London, you've probably heard of GDS, Government Digital Services. This is a company in Boston. Uh, com another company in London, one of the earlier adopters of the idea. Uh, company in Sweden. Company in South Africa. They made a video that's online available. Uh, another group in Sweden, another group in London. South Africa, why am I showing you all these pictures? I'm showing you all these pictures so you can see it's not just one crazy guy going around the world. It's a bunch of crazy people all over the world. <laughs> Here's some people in Florida. Here's some people in Greece. I got most of these pictures off of Twitter. So um, you could go find these for yourself. And here's somebody in, um, in Sweden. Uh, I had done a workshop with them. And then they started working it on their own. The reason I want to show this is to see, you can see just how straightforward it is. Here's the people sitting in front of a couple tables they put together. And across the way, they have a larger monitor that they've also put on a table. So there's nothing high tech about this. You can do it really straightforward and really simply in almost any work environment. Um, Here's a group in Spain. I like to show this picture because I think they need bigger monitors. Um, <laughs> and then I've got a picture here of some people who have bigger monitors. <laughs> but I don't think they do programming there. This is, uh, I think this is NASA. So, uh, and they've been doing this a lot, uh, a lot longer, of course, than I have. But I think I like the idea of everybody's on the same mission. They're, they're all working together, focused on the same thing at the same time. I kind of like that idea. So that's why I show that. I want to show you a little video now. So this is a video we made in 2012 at Hunter Industries. Take me just a minute to get to it. Oh, we'll see how this works. Um, I have a lot to learn here about using my equipment. There we go. So this is um, a video we made in 2012. I was getting ready to go speak at a conference, one of the earliest conferences. We said, wouldn't it be nice to have a, a video of this? This is three minutes condensing a full day. So we spend the first hour every day in a learning session. We learn stuff together. And if you want to know more about that afterwards, you can ask me questions. We don't do stand-ups. Because nobody has to ask, what did you do yesterday? Because we all did it yesterday. <laughs> right? And so we don't have meetings, hardly any meetings at all. There's a few things we do, but not much. You'll see this is about the environment. We have a couple uh, projectors and a single computer. But this is much more important. We have the concept of a driver. The driver is the person at the keyboard. Their job is to just merely translate the things that the navigators are talking about into code. Our product owners come and spend time with us. They might spend a couple hours or the whole day. I like to think of them as part of the team. We have a manager or a coach, you know. <laughs> Managers always act like they're working hard. Um, so after the product owners are with us, basically what happens is if a product owner, and we're using the term product owner, we would just mean an expert in the software that they need in the company. When they're working with us, we spend a bunch of time uh, with them, understanding their need, but in little parts. We'll work on this today, get it done today, work on the next thing for them tomorrow, and get it done tomorrow. So we're going to spend two or three hours with our product experts looking at what we just finished, verifying it's what they think they want, and delivering that. So we were going from delivering every few weeks to delivering every day. So I, I want to show it up to this point. We take our lunches together. So we have to come in at about the same time, take lunch at about the same time, leave at about the same time, so that we have time that's, that's uh, correlated or synchronized. Okay? But I want to show you another video. So that video just basically will go on more of the same. The key thing there is the driver and navigator. And we'll talk about that in a minute. I'm going to try and get on the internet here. And if I can, we're good. You guys have heard of YouTube probably, right? YouTube. This is a place they put, you can put videos and stuff there. Um, so right now it's telling me I have no internet connection. So if this uh, doesn't allow me to do it, that's OK. I'll guide you to where you can go see it. But I'm going to try real quick to see if I can get uh, one of these things ought to get us through there, right? This one here. Event? Oh. oh, it's saying you can't get there. So let me try event. So what do you have to do for event? What is it? Well, we'll find out. And if this doesn't work, that's OK. It's connecting. 
So you say, I got it wrong. No S? I always just throw an S in just in case. It's sure taking its time, isn't it? I like these little... Uh... So let's not worry about it. We'll just go on. So we have a video, it's available on YouTube, that they did in July of this same thing, but with the entire, uh, the new work area that we have. So if that comes up, um, we'll shut that down. If that actually comes up, it, it looks like we should have it. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that video, and if not, um, yeah, it's just, it's too tired. There's too many people here. Would everyone please leave? <laughs> that won't work, will it? Okay, let's just go on. So you get to see basically the same video if you go to YouTube and just put in mob programming. You can see both of those videos, uh, as a matter of fact. So don't worry about it too much. Let's just get back to the presentation. Huh. Wrong one. So remember, never become a speaker. It's just not worth it. It's <laughs> not worth it. Let's see. So we can, we can try this. Um, let's try that one. We're back in business, right? So the other video just shows with six, with six teams. They now have eight teams. And the, the, main, the primary reason that I show it is that you can see how dynamic it is with having six teams interacting with each other as needed throughout the day. So the teams work on their own tasks or their own work, but they also share in that work. So they can go back and forth. But we'll, we'll, um, you'll be able to find it in YouTube, see it there. So I'm gonna to explain to you a little bit about the driver navigator model of working. So in this case, we see somebody sitting with the keyboard. Their job is to be the driver. You can think of about it like a, a pilot in an airplane with a co-pilot and a navigator and maybe a radio man. And those people are all helping fly the plane. The pilot has a specific job, but they're being guided by everybody else. So the, the basic idea is here is the driver is listening to the ideas. And when there's an idea that the team wants to put into the computer as code, that's when the driver writes code. Under the direction, so to speak, of the rest of the team. Everybody else is a navigator. So the navigators are all working together to decide what we're gonna put into the computer. We have one basic guideline that we follow, and this is it here. For an idea to go from somebody's head into the computer, it has to go through someone else's hands. I'm gonna say that again, because I think that's really important. This is known as strong pairing, and I believe it was invented by Llewellyn Falco. The basic idea is for something to go from my head into the computer, I have to be able to communicate it so somebody else can put it into the computer. Takes the programming and elevates it from something that an individual is doing to something a team is doing. So let's look a little bit about how this is. In software development, we have computers. And to communicate with the computers, we use keyboards. Does anybody here know why we use keyboards? Because you can't just think it. I like that. It's, but it's, it's a, I think it's a little bit more difficult than that. And that is that we haven't figured out a better way. We haven't figured out a better way. Has anybody seen that movie Matrix? You know Matrix. All we gotta do is hook that thing in the back of our head and then we're gonna be okay. So we don't have that yet, okay? So here's the thing. The keyboard is a dumb input device. When I'm talking to you right now, I'm not speaking like we speak with a, with a keyboard. With a keyboard, we're actually inputting characters. I'm at least using words. So this is kind of a tricky thing. We're using a very primitive way of getting our code into the computer. When we work as a team, we have a big advantage now. We have the driver, which can be thought of as a smart input device. Now in California, where I'm in, this is how, this is how most developers look. And so, when you're sitting at the keyboard, your job is to funnel or channel the things that the team wants and turns it into code. We've now elevated from having a primitive input device, a keyboard, into having a very advanced input device, a human being. It's a very interesting change. It means almost anybody can now program. They don't need to be able to operate a computer or even uh, know the programming language or anything like that. So everybody on the team is a navigator, including the driver. But not everybody on the team has to take the keyboard. 
The keyboard is for the people who feel comfortable uh, working in front of other people at a keyboard. So if you don't feel like you can, you still can be part of a team. The point is we have in the navigators all the knowledge that we need to get this work done. That's what we're about. We want to have all the knowledge together, gathered in one place, thinking and working together. It basically goes like this. We work throughout the day, rotating the person at the keyboard. Because the person at the keyboard isn't the fundamentally important part of this. It's the thinking and the discussing that's important. So we use a timer. I won't go into that in too much detail. And every few minutes, the person at the keyboard switches up. And throughout the day, we do a rotation. So every time the timer goes off, the next person takes the keyboard. And we can do that in many different models. This just happens to be how we did it with a timer. So this is very straightforward. And if we had time here, uh, we could demonstrate it very easily. Uh, it basically comes from a concept of doing coding dojos of a specific sort. And I'll share a little bit about that in a minute. And if you, has anybody here done a coding dojo where you would go with a group of other developers? And so that would be no, one person, two. Do you, do you live here? So, oh, hello from Diana. Oh. Right? And so, um, boy, it's a fun thing to do. And I'd be happy to show you how to do it. Anybody here who wants to start doing them. But, but I'll share a little bit more about that in a minute. So the basic idea is once the rotation's up, the person at the keyboard switches in again. So it's not uh, five people or six people watching somebody program. It's five or six people programming together. Now, we are doing constant code review, constant design review. We are constantly talking about what we want to go into the project and how we're going to put it in there. So we're always working together to come up with the very best we can out of this group to get into the computer. So when I first started talking about this in 2012, I was at a conference. And somebody, uh, I didn't have a scheduled talk on this. I was talking about a testing uh, mechanism. But people started coming up and saying, hey, we heard about this thing that you're doing with this whole team programming stuff. Can you share that with me? So I started doing that. And after two or three people came up and others were gathering around, I started realizing I can't do this all day, just trying to explain about mom programming. So I said, let me go and see if I can get a room. And they were doing an open jam where you could go and sign up for a slot to talk. And I went ahead and started talking about it. So one of the first questions people would ask was, how did you invent this? So I'm going to tell you a little story about how we invented it. See how quickly we can get through it. This is a picture of me, by the way. Um, I'm a very capable, handsome, um, <laughs> young. I have a head full of hair. I'm not afraid of anything. And so this is uh, how I think of myself. But you have to have an image of yourself that allows you to at least get through the day. And this helps me get through the day. I was asked to join this company, Hunter Industries in San Marcos, California. They're a manufacturer of high quality landscape irrigation products. I have them at my home and I bought my home used 15, 16, 17 years ago and the sprinklers were in at that time. For 15, 16, 17 years they've been working flawlessly at my home. In Southern California we have to actually irrigate our, our landscape. I don't know if you ever have to do that here, do you? We don't get rain. Uh, so I knew this was a company that made very high quality stuff and I really wanted to work with them. So they asked me to come work for them to manage a team of software developers that wanted to become agile. They were, they were really wanting to start exploring doing agile stuff. This was in tw uh, 2011. So uh, they had some big nasty projects and some big problems they wanted to deal, deal with. I looked at the code in these big nasty projects that were not going very well and uh, I like to review code. And I just noticed a lot of problems in there. And I thought, you know, let's, let's go about this a little differently than we might normally do it. Instead of coming in to just, let's get these projects done, I said, let's put those big projects on the back burner. I don't know if you know the term back burner. Do you know back burner here on a stove? If you have four burners on the stove, you're going to cook on the front ones, and you can put the stuff to simmer on the back ones. So like you start some soup, you put it on the back burner. It can cook for a long time while you're doing the other stuff. So I wanted to put off doing the big projects so that we can get better at understanding clean code, how to refactor, how to recognize problems in our code and fix them, how to um, decouple things, how to get better naming. I wanted to see if we could learn to be better team players and things like that. So we put those on the back burner. One of the things that's really important to me is if we recognize that the people doing the work are those that are best suited to determine how to do that work, then we can probably improve our processes really rapidly. 
If we think that we can tell other people how to improve their processes, then we're probably going to miss the really good opportunities that exist but can only be recognized but by the people working in the system. Another thing that's really important to me is that we study together. So when we work together, we're under a certain pressure to get work done. And maybe our, our pay and our bonuses and, and our raises are all dependent on how well we get our work done. But when we study together, we can just work without pressure to learn something together. And that's something that's important to me. The interactions that we do when we're learning together are different than the interactions we do when we're working together or playing together. There's at least three different levels there. So one of a philosophy I have, I don't think, uh, it's just a theory, but I think if we practice things together without the pressure of getting actual work done, we're going to get a kind of dynamic into the team that we can't get any other way. So we started in with this idea of having a weekly practice session. And because I'm really familiar with doing the coding dojos, I introduced the idea of doing coding dojos. Now everyone on the team was invited to participate, but not required to participate. They were invited to attend, but they were not required to attend. These are important things to me. It's voluntary. So we were meeting together about every uh, once a week, Friday for two to three hours, to do coding dojos. And in the coding dojo, it's very similar to what I've already expressed to you about uh, how we would work together. There'll be somebody at the keyboard, they're the driver. Somebody standing next to them, they're the navigator. And everybody else is observing and preparing because they're gonna be a navigator soon. We don't work that way, but this is the way we were uh, doing our study sessions before we discovered mob programming. So every four minutes we would rotate and we had been practicing this way for five or six months. Another thing that's really important to me is that we get good at getting good results from retrospectives. Retrospectives are common, you see them all over the place, but I also find that we often don't get good results from doing the retrospectives. People will build up a backlog of actions they want to take to improve things, but they don't actually ever get around to improving those things. So I believe that doing the retrospectives is good, but we want to get good at having good results. And one good way to do that, I've sort of grown to believe, is let's learn how to turn up the good. So I learned this from Kent Beck in his book, uh, Extreme, Programming, Extreme Programming Explained. If you don't have that book, I recommend it very highly. The first version, which they now call the white book, because it had a white cover, I guess, um, he tells a little story about all the practices that he really thought were pretty good because he had good experiences with them. And he thought, what if they were like the knobs on a control board and I could just turn them up at will? How good can we turn things up? How high can we make the goodness go? And so I like that idea. And I take that as just being turn up the good. Look for the things that are good and figure out how to turn up the things that are good. So one day it came that we needed to resurrect or bring forward one of those things I'd put on the back burner one of those nasty projects that we had put off as we were building our capabilities. When I first looked at the code for this project, I didn't want to go to the people who had written it and say, look, this is lousy code. Because how would you like it if your new boss came in, looked at your work and said, this is lousy work. Nobody would like that. And I figured I'd already done that sort of thing when I was younger. It never works anyways. So I thought, I'm just going to um, make an environment where we can learn to recognize the problems in the code and learn how to fix them. So we were resurrecting this project. I knew there were a lot of problems under the surface, with all these hidden problems. And we decided to get together. A couple people that were working on it said, we need some help. We want to look at this. So we brought everyone together in a meeting. Now, in a typical meeting, we gather together. We talk with each other. We reveal to each other the things we think are a good topic to talk about. In this case, where should we work on this code? Who should work on what? Uh, should the whole team be working on it? Those sorts of things. But as we opened up the code to start looking at it, somebody noticed a problem in the code. So here we were applying the things we'd been learning over the last six months. Somebody said, look at that long method in there. And, and someone else said, oh, well, I know how to fix that. So they stood up to start navigating it. And somebody else took the keyboard. So now we were doing a coding dojo style for actual work, and we hadn't been doing that. We were, were, we were experimenting a little bit with pair programming, but uh, we certainly hadn't worked as this group's model. This is how we discovered it. So we started working on it together. After about an hour and a half of doing that, somebody came into the room and said, uh, you guys have to leave, we've reserved this room. Now we could have just gone back to our cubicles and kept working on our regular work. 
but somebody on the team said, let's go get another room. So this idea of applied turn up the good. So we start working together using a coding dojo style. We felt we were making really good progress and somebody said, let's just keep doing this. So when we got to the other room, we scheduled another room, went right to it. Somebody on the team said, let's just schedule rooms for the rest of the day. So I think that we all felt this was a good thing. At the end of the day, we did a retrospective. We were trying to do retrospectives daily at that time, little short retrospectives. And we would ask ourselves, what went well today? And everybody on the team said, this was really good working together. Let's do it again tomorrow. So we scheduled rooms for the whole next day. At the end of that day, we decided to just continue working that way over the next few days. After a few days, we decided to find a permanent working area and we went on doing that. That was five years ago, last month, and we've continued working this way for five years. Now, I no longer work at Hunter. I'm out doing these talks everywhere, but uh, they continue to do it there, and you saw photographs of that earlier. So it's this combination of these little ideas that the people doing the work can figure out how to do it, that we should be practicing and studying together, that we should be trying to get better at retrospectives, and that we should be turning up the good to kind of combine in us discovering this way of working. If we had set out to discover this, I'm not sure we would have. But this is the basic idea. This little saying here I was taught about almost 40 years ago, and I've tried to apply it in my life. The basic concept is that it's not about the work we're doing, it's about how well we've set up our environment to excel at the work we're doing. It's about the environment, not so much about the things that we think we need to do. This worked out really well for us. So that's the story of us discovering mob programming. We didn't set out to change the world. I, if, I w if I had sat down to say, I'm gonna figure out some way so people invite me to speak at conferences all over the world, I don't think I could have ever figured that out. It just happened by accident that people are interested in this. So I often ask this question, why would we work this way? Why would we work everybody all together? Anybody wanna share? Why, why do you think we would work this way? Anybody? What's that? Very, very rapid learning environment. We're sharing a lot of information. We're learning a lot about the do domain. We're learning about programming. Lots of things. What else? What's that? Less mistakes. less mistakes. Or we're paying a lot less for our mistakes, but it's a good point. Less, fewer mistakes. Anything else? We're pulling all the knowledge together. So we're putting all of our ability on one little spot so we get a quick result. What else? Fun and engaging. Fun and engaging. I love to have that come up. I should pay someone to be in the audience to always bring that up. Because it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. What else? Saves time. What's that? Does it save time? Saves time. It's an interesting thing. We're now getting work done a lot sooner. Stories that used to take a couple weeks when one person was working on it take an hour or two when the whole team's working on it because there's not, nothing blocking us from just getting the work done. So those are some good ideas. These are the same things we were noticing, but this is kind of a trick question. Why would we work this way? Because the team decided to work this way. I've worked at a lot of places where the team was not allowed to decide how to work. They had to work as they were told to work. And that is a very different concept. So I'll let that settle in for you. Another question, I'm not gonna ask it of you, is how can we work this way? This is questions that used to come up whenever I'd give a talk, and so I've included them in the talk. People would ask me, how can you work this way? With five or six developers sitting together, they never get along, they'll always just argue about stuff. You'll never decide what to do, because they'll be fighting all the time. Well, we didn't actually find that to be true. What we did find is we started getting on each other's nerves. You work with somebody together all day long, you get on each other's nerves. So one day we noticed we were started kind of um, being short with each other and somebody said, you know, we gotta figure out how to make this work better. So the first thing we did is we went to the Agile Manifesto which says the first value is we value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So we realized we really weren't valuing the individuals and their interactions as much as we should. So we got together in a little meeting like a, um, a retrospective and we each wrote down on a piece of paper, how would you like to be treated by your coworkers? One word, 
Just write one word on a piece of paper, but as many papers as you can. Come up with as many words as you can on papers. And we put them together, grouped them, and we ended up, after we grouped all that and voted on it, with these three words. Let's treat each other with kindness, consideration, and respect. That's how I want to be treated. Each individual kind of agreed. We want to be treated with kindness, consideration, and respect. But we didn't clearly know how to do that. So we made a little agreement with each other. Let's pretend to treat each other with kindness, consideration, and respect. And try it for a day and see what that feels like. And after a day of doing it, we reflected on it, and it seemed like it was much better. So we just continued doing that. And now it's an interesting thing. When we first started doing this, I, I'm the hardest person in the world to work with. I have a short temper. I uh, tend to get frustrated easily. I'm not very patient. I usually think if we have a good idea that that's the one we should use, and so on and so on. Uh, I've become a much better person working with people who are all dedicated to treating each other kindly uh, with consideration and respect. For example, consideration means I'm going to consider your point of view. I'm going to consider your feelings. And to be able to consider your feelings and your point of view, I have to be able to hear your point of view and hear your ideas. And to be able to hear your ideas, I have to stop talking sometimes. So we were just learning how to interact well. This worked out really well for us. So this is sort of an important point. A lot of people would come to me after they started doing this and saying, uh, we like the mob programming, but we can only do it for a few hours a day because it wears us out. And we thought, well, we're working this way all day, every day. And we weren't getting worn out. So what we decided was, what was going on here is that some people feel they have to pay attention to everything that's going on. But when you're mob programming, you have a whole group to share the memory of what's going on. So if I miss something, somebody else is getting it, it doesn't matter that I missed it. What's important is that we are prepared to contribute the highest value we can at the right time and in just the right way. That means our ideas, when they're important, we have to recognize that and be ready to share them, and the rest of everybody there has to be ready to absorb it and accept it. If we don't do this, then we're trying to contribute too much. We don't have to express every one of our ideas. We don't have to always discuss everything. As soon as we have a usable idea, we can try it. And if we find it's perfect, we go on. If we find it's just good enough, we can go on. If we think we can come up with a better idea, we do. So if there's two developers, for example, and one has one idea, the other has another idea, why not try both? Let's try a little of that and a little of that, see which one works. So these are the things that allowed us to work what I would consider in a relaxed and sustainable manner. So this is a question that always comes up. How can you be productive with five people at one computer? Now this is a problem because um, I'm not sure that's a good question. So the first time this was asked of me was at my very first talk that I gave on this, somebody asked that. And my response was, I don't know. I just noticed we are. We're more productive. I don't know how we can be more productive, but we are. So this is what we did. We went back and we looked at what we could get done in two days prior to working this way and what we could get done in two days after we started working this way. And this was the difference in what we were getting done. Adding together the work of five people on a team as opposed to bringing together the work of five people on one team. Um, this was the difference. Now does that prove anything? It doesn't. It just indicates that something has changed. Something's different. Is each yellow card or each blue card the same uh, size in each of these photos? Not necessarily. It could be any number of reasons we're getting a lot more cards done. But the question, I think, was wrong. How can we be productive with five people at one computer? So I started reversing the question. What makes you think you can be productive when you separate the people who should be working together? It's a different way of thinking about it. Now, I don't know if it's enough different way of thinking about it, but I take a cue from uh, Peter Block who says, transformation comes more from pursuing profound questions than seeking practical answers. It's about coming up with a better question. When you come up with the right questions, answers start becoming less important. Because usually today's answer is just tomorrow's problem. Whatever we decide to do today is just going to introduce new issues for tomorrow. So I thought, let's try and come up with a better question. And this is the one that I came up with. What are the things that destroy productivity? So normally I would ask an audience, but in, in the um, 
essence here of trying to stay on the schedule, I'm going to share some of the ideas. Almost everything can go into some of these buckets here. Communication problems, uh, trying to get answers through emails and things like that. Uh, decision making problems, where we are afraid to make a decision because the repercussions of us making that decision could reflect poorly on us. So we try to get help from everybody we can. We hold meetings and we spend time trying to make a decision and backing up our ideas, our decision uh, uh, information that led to us making this decision and so that later on we can defend our decision. And then another one is pe uh, people doing more than is barely sufficient. Another one is technical debt. Bugs is something that destroys productivity. Every time we get a re bug report, we have something we have to work on, we're no longer doing the work that we were wanting to get done this week, and so on and so on. So I'm gonna share a little bit about one thing, and that's this. We didn't set out to solve any of these problems. All we set out to do is turn up the good on working well together. And most of the problems that I've seen in software development kind of faded away. So you'll notice that you'll see this wonderful animation. They faded away when we start working as a team. Pretty amazing, huh? Yes. So this was an interesting thing. So I'm going to share one thing about it. Uh, what I call the question cue time. So this is how it goes. So I'm going to do this pretty quickly. The amount of time that we must wait to get the answer to a question that is blocking us. That's the question cue time. We're waiting to get the answer. If we do, sorry, I'm gonna go a little too fast for photographs here, so be ready to take your pictures. If we use a value stream map, we could say the green bar represents when we're coding, and the red bar represents when we're waiting to get an answer to a question that's blocking us, and that line that's going up and down is the blocking question. So I'm gonna do a very rudimentary example. This is contrived example. What if for every hour we work, we get one blocking question. So if we do a, a value stream map on that and it doesn't take us any time to get the answer, we're just gonna be done like that. We're, we're gonna continue working throughout the day. If it takes us two minutes to get the answer, then we're wasting 16 minutes in the day. If it takes us 10 minutes, we're wasting an hour and we're starting to have some context switching, which can really be a problem for us. What if it took an hour to get the answer? Now we're wasting half the day. What if it took us all day to get the answer? Have you ever had that situation? You send off an email, you're hoping you get an answer, and you don't hear back till the next day. And they usually say, I don't understand your question. So, um, so we get another day of round tripping on that. So how do we typically solve for this? We've got this thing and we're blocked. What do we usually do? We switch to another task. If the task was perfectly aligned like this, and since I got to make these slides that it is, then it would look like this throughout the day. We're always busy. But we're also always blocked. That's an interesting problem. <laughs> so we're having these contexts which just happen all the time. So what did we deal with? The symptom. The symptom was we're not busy enough. We're not busy all the time. So we solve for that. But we solve for it and not for the problem, which is we're not getting our answers to our questions in a timely fashion. So here's the thing. Let's not solve a queuing problem, which is what this was, by introducing an inventory problem. We have two things in inventory now. Inventory is stuff that we've started working on that isn't yet delivering value. We don't want that. We want to have stuff created and delivered and earning value right away. So how did we solve for this on our team? I just told you a minute ago. How did we solve for it? We didn't solve for it it faded away, right? We noticed that we could just answer questions immediately if it was something the team could answer. And we noticed with our product owners, they wanted to get the, the work done quickly. And they agreed to just simply answer questions immediately. In other words, if we sent them an email, uh, a message, phone called them, they'd get back to us immediately so we wouldn't ever go more than two minutes getting a question answered. We didn't solve for that ourselves. One of the product owners noticed some work didn't get done for them that day. He said, what happened? And we said, hey, you didn't answer our questions. And he said, well, what if I get back to you within two minutes? Guaranteed. So then we, will, we can just continue working on. So this is what I consider a one piece flow. So I'm gonna share two or three more things. Are we out of time yet? We're getting close, right? Two more minutes. This is a continuous learning environment. 
When you have a learning attitude, you can really take advantage of it. I'm going to just share two little ideas. The first one is when the, when the beginner makes a mistake, you can't ever make fun of them. Don't make fun of them. Own it with them. This is like me and my mother when I was a child, and my, I was, my mom was helping me learn to bake a cake. And I started mixing the cake mix, and it went all over the place. And my mom, instead of saying, get out of the kitchen, she just said, well, let's clean this up. And let's figure out how to do it right. She said, the first time I used that mixer, I made a mess too. She could have said, look at you, you made a mess. But she didn't. She owned it herself. Another thing is the beginners often come up with ideas that the more advanced person could never have. So this represents another time with my mother. She was actually teaching me how to make pot holders, little pot holders you could crochet, even though that's knitting. But, um, and I, she showed me a pattern to do, and I was doing it. But I didn't like it. It wasn't fancy enough. So I went to the craft book, and I found a fancier pattern, and I started working on it. My mom came back in, and she could have said, why didn't you finish the pattern we were working on? But instead, she said, wow, that's beautiful. Can you show me how to do that? So she was saying, your ideas are good, too. I want to know your ideas, and I can learn from them. I like this. Now, one other thing to worry about is that you're going to be exposed. So we'll finish this up now. Being exposed means others are going to see how you work. And you may not be very good at some things they think you're good at, and you have to be willing to accept that. That people are going to find out what you're good at and what you're not good at, but that's OK on a team. And that's why we need to treat each other with kindness, consideration, and respect. Pay attention to your health. This is really important. When you're sitting in a chair all day long, you need to have a good chair. When you just do it for a short meeting, you sit in chairs like this, right? So you have to have good chairs. You have to have a hand cleaner, uh, uh, sanitizer. You have to make sure you're not straining your neck or hurting your back or your legs. Because you can, if you're sitting at a table all day long and you're always turning your head to see the screen, then you're going to get a sore neck. So watch out for those things. Everybody asks, what's the ideal number of team members? And our rule is this. If you feel you're contributing or you feel you're learning something, then you can stay with the team. If you feel you're not learning anything and you're not contributing, you can go off and work on something alone. You're never forced to stay with the team. That's our team heuristic. By the way, we've had as many as 14 people on the team at one time for a couple days uh, on a really critical project. So that's our team heuristic. Everybody asks, do we recommend mob programming? And I don't. I just am sharing with you something that our team did, and I invite you to try it. You might find it's a lot of fun. You might also find that it's, it's useful to you, but you might not. Uh, last thing, though, I do recommend you get good at getting, getting good results from retrospectives. That's really, really useful. Always turn up the good. So I think this is a time for questions, and I can, we can spend a few extra minutes at that. So does anybody have a question? I think there was one up here. So um, my question is, how, how do you eliminate and control like distractions? Uh, for example, emails, cell phones, people getting pinged. Uh, especially, how do you control that when you have a distributed team? So uh, the question kind of it relates to how, c how can the team continue to be effective when those kinds of things are going on? I don't think we need to control them. The team is kind of self-controlling. Like if, they feel, if somebody feels they're getting distracted too much from the work, they might not work with the team for a while. They'll just go take care of the things they need to take care of. So if, uh, with us, we, would have, we had one email account, essentially, that all communications that came to the team would go through that one account. That way, if somebody's gone for the day uh, or whatever, people are still getting answered. And then uh, if somebody needs to get a private phone call, well, that's just life. You've got to deal, deal with that. But almost everything we did, we did as a team. So if another department would come to us, Rather than having one person go and deal with them, they would come and deal with the whole team. So we have one telephone, and we'd always answer it like this. Hi, this is the software development team. You're on speakerphone. So they know that when they're because otherwise, who knows what they might say. So there you go. Is that, is that sort of covered a little bit? So what about distributed teams then? People who have their TVs on or doing laundry as they're working. I mean, there's, that happens, right? So when you're working with a distributed team, uh, everybody's picture is right there. And if it's a lot of noise and stuff going on, somebody is going to say, hey, can you find a way to turn that noise down? And if not, then maybe, um, maybe it's not ideal. You know? I would say, you can, work it, you can work it out. Why don't they just go and work from the bathroom? And they can lock the door. Okay? 
So I really don't have an easy answer for that. You just, it's just one of those things you have to figure out. Here's a question here. Can you share your experience on doing remote uh, mob programming? So I've really? worked doing remote for about two years. And the first experiences that we had with that was uh, at Hunter. One of the people wanted to work from home for a while because his wife was having a baby. So he went and worked from home and we set up for that and it worked out really good. It just so happened that he also had an 80 inch monitor at home. So um, it worked out pretty good. So yeah, it works well. I've been doing it for several years now. And uh, the main thing is you have to be able to share the keyboard. So finding a system that works well for that. I've been using Zoom quite a bit, uh, but as far as different web conferencing tools, uh, things like GoToMeeting, things even like Skype can work. So it's not that hard. Some people like the people at Corgibytes. They're using a, uh, a VNC. So that they have a server somewhere that everybody can log into. So it's not that hard to do. It may be a little bit more difficult, but it's still, it works. It works. So I guess we're done, huh? So is it time for lunch? Is lunch coming up or is there another talk in here? Okay. What's that? Oh, there's another question. Oh, there's another session before lunch. Okay, so we're done. Thank you, thank you, thank you.